Hello, welcome back to the third part of our Mon tutorial series. I'm Michael, the chief developer of Animat, and in the third part we will talk about a bit more sophisticated modules of the import functions of Mont and the way how to get data, especially um, if we come from the open data sector. In the first two parts, we learned about the different aspects of maps, so that we need a georeference map in the UTM system in order to know where on the Earth we are located and in order to get access to the OpenStreetMap data, for example. We also learned how to digitize objects and we learned how to export our MOND world into an NVMED world so that we can make model simulations. So today, most of the aspects that we have seen in the first two tutorials are actually um, part of this tutorial as well, but we will walk a little bit uh, faster through these sections because we already know that and you can always go back to the first and the second tutorial. So um, the test case we want to talk about today is so uh, we want to make a simulation, for example, now about San Francisco and Twin Peaks because we want to have a flow pattern around Twin Peaks and we want to see how the wind um, behaves in the building structure of San Francisco. So the first step, like always, is we have to initialize our Mons map to a georeference map on the correct position on Earth. And this is always done uh, using the world setup dialog and the most easy way is that we ask the internet for all the settings we want to know. So we go to find location. Again, we would like to use google.com for a search engine, but you can also try with geo names. And type in the location, which is then Twin Peaks and San Francisco. So there we are, for example, Twin Peaks, Boulevard, San Francisco, longitude, latitude, that seems to match and a specific standard time. So we select the location. So everything is set up. It's in the UTM system with the easting and northern coordinates and it's in UTM zone 10. So we make the map a bit smaller so that it is not that extensive to calculate say create new project map and here we are so always the first step could be if we don't have any other information we just may zoom out and then we say okay we ha have a look at what is available on openstreetmap so we just press the button get openstreetmap environment as you know from the last time so we get an um, access to the overpass rpe which connects directly to the openstreetmap data set which is the data set as it is at the right moment, so um, it's just downloaded from the OpenStreetMap servers and loaded into the program. So that takes, of course, a while to interpret the dots and lines and polygons. And then we get the usual import filter for OpenStreetMap. So here we are after the import of the OpenStreetMap data. And we have our well-known import dialog, I zoom out a bit, so it's a quite a complex area. So like in the previous um, tutorial, we will not talk about the um, dialog in detail very much, so we just say we're interested in the buildings, so we keep the uh, predefined rule buildings, I press the button test settings to make a text, test export of the buildings we have in that area, actually um, we have about 50,270 polygons here and about 14,929 objects are actually buildings. So we keep that, say finish. So this is the most easiest way to import the building data. So as you may remember from the last tutorial, um, to create an environment model, the most important information for a building layer we need is the height of the building. And the most crucial information always is their, the height information stored for the buildings, because this is in many times not the case for OpenStreetMap data. So quick check, we go to OpenStreetMap buildings and say um, layers and display style. 
Then we go to color by value and select the height field to be colored. And then we have a look at it. Okay, we see it's not that bad. So there are quite a number of buildings that actually carry a high tech, but there are also a huge number of buildings which actually do not carry a high tech. So these buildings will be not imported into NVMet because their height is zero. So what can we do against that? Simply, we need other sources of information. So you can go to the airport and fly to San Francisco, which is probably a good idea, and try to collect the building data and the building height on your own. But there is, of course, other information. So on the first side, there is a lot of information from the local authorities, from the website, from the cities, from the government, and so on. They often um, give you open data of many aspects you need, buildings, uh, vegetation, and many other things. But this is different for, for every city. So if you are interested in open data for San Francisco, you have to go to the San Francisco state site. And if you're interested in New York City data, you go to New York City. And there is no clear thing um, how you find the data on the website. So you have to find your own way. But there is one other thing, and we have linked that on the Envimet website. So when you go to the Envimet website and then to the start page, because there is one big data collection, one big data set of um, building height, um, building footprints. And this is actually has been collected by Microsoft. Um, if you go to digital documents and resources, and then you go to open data overview, we have collected some links. And one of the big data sets, of course, is the OpenStreetMap data. We have talked about that. And the second is the Microsoft building data footprints, which have been uh, collected by Microsoft, basically from satellite data and from um, stereoscopic analysis. And there are different releases. So there is one release from 2018, which covers a lot of buildings, but they are often lacking information. So there are more than 125 million buildings in that release, but many of them do not carry a high tech. So this is this, uh, why the uh, the first release from 2017 is much better because it just includes just includes 9,000 uh, 9.8 um, million buildings, but they do carry um, the height information. So these um, set from 2017 is um, collected on the OpenStreetMap wiki. So if you follow the links. You see there is a lot of information. So this is the March 2017 release that we are interested in. And um, there is a, it's a huge data set. So this is why everything is um, separated or collected. So here you, for example, see um, special information from California. California is even broken up in, in other different um, parts of set California. And here we are with the Bay Area. and. Here you follow the links. And what actually now happens is that you can download a zip file. Or first, first you're going to OneDrive because it's from Microsoft. So that takes a second or two to navigate to the correct location. And then finally, you get a zip file of the Bay Area and you download this zip file, which takes a, a while because it is well, two, 300 megabytes large. So we just download that. And then once we're finished, we extract the zip file to our folder. So now um, I've downloaded the zip file and I have extracted the content of the zip file to a folder. So what is in it? It's a shapefile. Uh, a, shape, a shapefile is the very basic form of um, transporting geo-based data. So the shapefile is something like a text file version of a, a, a normal um, textual information and the shapefile is the same for something that is located in space. So it's a very basic um, file structure, which is also very 
old because it has been um, invented by S3 for the uh, Arc Info software back in the 1980s. And it's still alive because it's simple and it's straightforward. The only issue with a shapefile is that it actually is not just a file. So it, there is this file Bay Area SHP, so that's the shapefile. But that's not completely true because there are at least two other files belonging to this shapefile. So this is the a Bay Area DBF, which is a DBase file which carries actually the attribute table of the shapefile and the file shx, which is the link between the objects, the geometry of the objects stored in the shapefile and the data of the objects stored in the dbase file. And this is the link between the two. So you need all these three files to have a function shape file. So shape file is actually a shape file system. And we can import these data now into Mond. So this is simply going done by going to add GIS layer and then import from SHP files shapefile. So this opens the dialog here. As we go to open shapefile, we navigate to the file we have just extracted and the dialog only shows us the SAP file, but it's assuming and it's demanding that the other files, the shx and the dbf file is all, are also existing, otherwise it simply won't work. So here we are. You see it's a massive file. It includes 3,735,450 objects and it covers a range in the east-west direction of 50 kilometers and the y direction of 700 35 kilometers, so that's pretty large. So please do not try to load this shapefile in one go, because this simply doesn't make any sense. Probably it crashes because Mon still is a 32-bit um, application. It probably won't fit in the computer memory. But what you can do here, because we already have a map defined, we already have map bounds. And what we can say here in the import option is ignore objects outside the map. So that means it's running through the file with all these 3 million objects, but it's only picking up those objects from the shapefile that are actually inside the bounds of my recent map. So the file can be as large as it, like, as it likes to be, um, technically more or less. So only the objects inside our map bounds are imported. So let's do that. That takes a while. So here we are back. After the import of the shapefile, no, there's not much you see. There is a new layer, which is the import from Bay Area, which is the name of the shapefile. And um, as well, you see that the um, shapes of the buildings are included in the map. And if we zoom in, we see that some, or most of them are matching, of course. Would be bad if they are completely um, in a different style. But of course, there are differences. So th that's a good sign because it shows that um, it's not the same data set. So it comes from different things. OpenStreetMap data comes from vo user volunteered um, digitalization processes, whereas the, the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft data comes from um, aerial observation and satellite data. So, for example, if we move over here, we see there are slight differences in the correct or the absolute positioning of the data. But if we move to that little township here, so if we turn off the um, import data, so we still have these buildings which do not have uh, carrying a height um, beside other buildings here. And we turn on the on the Microsoft data and turn off the um, OpenStreetMap data now. And then we um, have a look what is actually the case for the um, height information from the Microsoft data. So we select the layer import from the area, which is the Microsoft data, and go to display style, say color by value, 
And the only information in the attribute table from the Microsoft shape file is the height information. And we remove the um, hatch style so that we can better see that. I see, wow, that looks much better. So the buildings that have been empty before now carry height information. So of course it's always a, a source of discussion which are the better data. Maybe the OpenStreetMap data are more accurate or more actual, but they don't carry the height information, whereas the Microsoft data maybe are more re not that recent like the OpenStreetMap data, but they do carry height information. So probably in some cases you do have to make a mixture maybe out of this software mod, maybe in the external GIS software to combine all these attributes. So, but for the moment we're happy with this. So these are the information from the Microsoft data and we see that almost every building, so for the moment I don't have see a building which doesn't carry height information. There are some buildings which are not included in the Microsoft data for whatever reason. And, but the other buildings which are inside the Microsoft data, they do carry height information. So they are, these data are available for our export process. So, but what about topography? The area is called Twin Peaks. That indicates that there is some significant topography in the area and it's maybe important in our MVMED simulations that we also include this topography information. So far all the buildings were standing on flat ground, but we can change this. There are a lot of topography models, a lot of height models Again, like for the building models, each city often provides high resolution um, topography models with the, um, terrain heights for their area. But the most easiest way, of course, is if we do have a common um, or better a global data size um, field where we can select the height of the terrain for any location on Earth, more or less, like in the OpenStreetMap data. And in fact, this is available. Um, it was made uh, available by the NASA and there were different sets um, the NASA um, actually did with satellite surveys. And if we go on the first page on my world and go to get topography, we have the option to directly access the, the NASA data, which are called SRTM data, um, using a, a service which is called Open Topography, which actually we helps us so that we do not need to go to the NASA servers and download the individual files for our exact location. So like um, for the um, OpenStreetMap data, Open Topography opens a web service which allows us to put in the boundary box, which is uh, the map box we have at the moment, and then it responds with the height information for the points. So there are different topography sources um, supported by um, Open Topography. So the Default is the SRTM by NASA, which has approximately a resolution about 30 meters at the ground. There are also other options. There's, for example, the old SRTM from NASA, which had a resolution about 90 meters. And there's also a Japanese starter set available, which has a lot of information about the ocean surface and has what is a resolution of 30 meters at the ground. So we use the NASA um, service, and this is all we have to do. Just we have the box, we have select the source of topography, and we just say get data and Mont does the rest to you. The only thing you have to do is to be a bit patient. And don't get worried if the computer says it's unresponsive. It's not the case, it's working. So here we are. You see nothing much to do. Everything is automatically joined to the map. And now we do have a topography layer, which includes the data of the terrain height, excluding the buildings, of course. The data from the NASA, which comes in a 30 meter resolution, is interpolated into a one meter resolution by MOND. And if we go to display style, we do see a different form of information layer. We see the information, what is the green color is below of 53 meters below uh, above sea surface and it rises up the tweaks uh, the, the peaks of twin peaks rises up to 261 meters so that's pretty high 
Uh, we can uh, change the, the style, for example, say we want to have a floating color scale, scale or we can change the transparency of the layer, say apply and update. So um, the changes will be included in the map. So in later versions of Mond, of course, we do will have a, a legend here on the side of the map or on the other side, and also this um, table of contents will be much more finer. So for the moment it is um, like it is, but it's still a full functioning version and it's interpolating the data. And now you see we have everything in place to make an environment model out of this. So last thing, we cannot make an M we can do this, but for the tutorial it's much too much work. So we uh, add another sub area. So we want to make an environment model of this area. Just give it a new area. Say so, okay, finish editing. Of course, we need to export the buildings that we have done from the Microsoft data into a modeling layer. That, that's pretty important because they are still the GIS layers. So that means they do carry the high tech, but um, they are not including all the information we need for an environment model. So I go to the import um, of the buildings and of course go to export to modeling layer, just like we have learned in the last um, tutorial of Mont. Say I want a building layer. And then again, where comes just the building top from from. This is taken from the attribute table height and it's in metric coordinates this time. The building button is not stored. So um, anything we can do is just to say that it's zero. So it stands on the ground. We do not have any information about building name. So we just keep it empty. And for the building materials, we do also not have an information. So we just say uh, 00, 00, 00, 00. So it uses the default materials. And same for the walls. And that's all the information we have. So can we say export to modeling layer? And then we get um, a new modeling layer. There it is. That hopefully includes all the buildings and the information. And then we go to the analyze tab and say create environment model. So we have the topography layer, we have the building layer, we select an area, which is new area, has the size of 2.8 kilometers by 2.4 kilometers, which is still pretty large. So we cannot do that in a, or we can do that if we have a very uh, fast computer in a two meter resolution. Um, in a five meter resolution, it will be 500 to 400, 400 more or less 500 to 500 crits. So we keep it as it is and say create model and then we will have a look at spaces what we have just created so of course that takes time because there are a pretty number of polygons it's actually 11,225 uh, 24 polygons that need to be rid right now so here we are with the exported data looks pretty good and finally we have to write them in an inx file So also don't forget to save your files, your mod files, because sometimes when you have imported uh, shape files, you have read OpenStreetMap data and get open topography data, the memory gets slow because it's still a 32-bit uh, application. We're going to change this in the near future, but for the moment it's, it's, it's pretty tough. So if you do have a good model, save it. And if you got an out of memory error message, so then just, um, just skip it and close mod and reopen mod. And most of the time things are running very smoothly then. So let's have a look at our new model in spaces. So we can close mod. We don't need it anymore at the moment. Go to the folder and have a look at our new Twin Peaks model, which of course takes time because it's a very huge model. So here we are, our model of Twin Peaks, including the topography. 
So one important uh, thing you need to know is, of course, the topography gets normalized. That means um, Envimet looks for the lowest point in your model domain and looks so and this lowest point is set to zero. So for example, um, if you go to the uh, model area settings and then we go to GeoReference and GM model, it says the reference level about sea level is 30 meter. So that means um, the lowest point in our model is 30 meters above sea level and this is assigned to zero. So we, there is no need to have all the information above sea level. The only thing that matters for our ambient model is, of course, the difference between the lowest point and the highest point. And the highest point is obviously somewhere here with um, 243 meters, uh, this one even here. And there is, of course, one thing we have not considered yet, because now it's a very high model and there are even some buildings on the top of the highest buildings uh, of the highest top so there's a building which is 42 meters high standing on a top of which is 230 meters high so that means the complete elevation of the building roof will be 254 meters so adding the topography level plus the building height this of course needs to be fitted into the environment model and when we go to edit and change settings in our model geometry we do not have enough grid cells at the moment to cover the height of 250 meters more or less as a it was a rule of thumb or it is a rule of thumb that you should have at least or approximately the double size of the height at your as your model top so that means your model top for this situation should be 500 meters so you don't be that strict so if it's 400 meter it probably will be okay as well you need to test out. If it's not okay with 400 meters, you maybe have to put it a little higher to 450 or 500 meters. So that's up to you to test this. But still, how can we reach 400 meters of model grids? So having 25 grids with three meter resolution, so including all the nesting grids, so that's far below 100 meters. And if we are not sure what the situation is, we can always go to the model inspector, so one that's closed here, and the, the model inspector gives us a good overview of what is the situation in our model at the moment. So this is here at tools and model inspector, and here you see the highest domain, the highest building is 90 meters, the highest DM point, and the highest point building plus DM is 6. 263 meters. So this does not add because the highest building in the domain does not necessarily need, needs to be standing on the highest point of the DEM. But still the top of our 3D model at the moment is at 73 meters. So that's far too low to fit a 240, uh, 58 meter building. So we have to change a lot of things. And the easiest thing to change is of course to include more grid cells in the vertical direction. So after it says closes, we go and go to settings. And we can easily say, okay, we want to have our 60 grids. And each grid should be 5 meters. So 6 by 5, that should be 300 meter as a model top. Maybe it's even not far enough, much enough. We apply these changes. So now the top of the model domain is in 297 meters. So it's still very close, but the highest model, uh, well, it's very, very close. But for the moment, we keep it as it is. There is another tutorial dealing without, with telescoping grids and so on, how to match your vertical grid size and your vertical grid constellation um, to the real existing model, but for the moment we're still a mod tutorial. So what I want to show you is how the gridded world of Twin Peaks from Mont looks like in the Envimet spaces. So then we turn on the 3D view, which of course takes a number of time, depending on your graphic cards, it takes more or less time. And it's creating a, a 3D impression on the domain. So here we are. 
So I'm moving it back a bit so that we can see something. This, of course, takes a significant amount of time because it's a really a very large model domain we do have here. So I find a good view angle to so that we see uh, most of the parts. So one thing you see, the topography is still messing. So we just see the buildings, or we see the shape of the height, more or less. So if we press the button DEM and turn it on, this also included the terrain information into our model. Of course, this again takes some time because the model needs to be re-rendered. So here we are. Welcome to Twin Peaks. So here we are at the end of our third part of the MONT tutorials. Thank you very much for watching. As we said, MONT is in the beta phase. We are heavily developing new tools and more improvement to MONT. So there will be a lot of changes in the next month, in the next year. So uh, stay tuned. But nevertheless, MONT is a working function in the MONT software. So you can start building your models straight away using Mod. Thank you for watching.